unique in India with over 1,200 species of different types of cacti. So it's wonderful to see this. And you'll tell us a little bit more about it, how you want to revive the palace that, has, that you have been restoring for the past five years. And now you're going to open it up to the public um, where people can stay at the property, where you want to introduce some cooking classes, and where you also want to exhibit and share the objects of the family with the public, where again, um, you are thinking about introducing the history of food and showcasing the history of food in, in the museum. So I'd like to hand it over to you. Thank you very much for taking the time to prepare this presentation for us and to share this beautiful story of the palace and the family. Thank you, Professor, for your introduction and for having us on this lecture series. So, and a very good evening to our Indian viewers and a very uh, good morning and a good afternoon to our international audience. Thank you for joining us as we take you through our history and our home. So I'll just give a summary about what we will talk about. So we'll be starting with the history where we'll be discussing how the state was founded where we'll also highlight some of the important rulers and their contributions. Then I'll be talking to you about our unique culinary culture, after which we'll move on to the palaces and tell you about the history, restoration, and the revival. Uh, following this, we'll take you inside the Jaswan Nawaz Palace, and we'll show you a few of our rooms while discussing the interiors and the furniture. <clears throat> So Stelana is located in the Malwa region of Madhya Pradesh. We border Rajasthan and we are also very close to the Gujarat border. Uh, the nearest city with an airport is Indore, which is three hours away. And we're also close to some popular destinations such as Udaipur, Bhopal, Mandu, Maheshwar and Ujjain. This is the family tree. Uh, <coughs> The Rathod dynasty uh, claimed descent from the ancient Rashtrakut Empire. Uh, my ancestors migrated north and made Jodhpur their home. And we are descendants of Raja Uday Singh of Jodhpur. His grandson Mahesh Das was made the Rao of Jalor by Shah Jahan. And his son Raja Ratan Singh gained further fame. And he was made the Maharaja of Ratlam. So I won't talk uh, about each and every ruler, but you skip to Raja Jai Singh and then you skip all the way to Raja Jaswan Singh. So this is Maharaja Ratan Singh Ji. Uh, <clears throat> at a young age of 23, Raja Ratan Singh, uh, he killed a mad elephant in the streets of Delhi and he was armed only with a dagger. So this gained him the attention of the Emperor Shah Jahan. And he made him a general in his army and he was posted in Afghanistan. So Ratan Singh continued to gain fame and especially in the campaigns against the Uzbeks at Kandahar and the Persians at Khorasan. For his feats of bravery, he was awarded 12 districts in Malwa and the uh, revenue at that time was 53 lakhs in the 17th century. In 1658, he was sent uh, against the rebel Mughal prince or Aurangzeb, and he was killed while fighting in the Battle of Dharmat. So before the Battle of Dharmat happened, he uh, divided his kingdom into 12 parts, one for each son, and of these 12 parts, Selana, Ratlam, and Sitamo were the most prominent. <clears throat> So now we'll talk about Raja Jai Singh. He was the great grandson of Ratan Singh. His father was killed by his uncle due to an argument about the division of the estates. Uh, then there was a fratricidal war uh, followed in which Jai Singh defeated the opposition and secured the throne for his elder brother. Jai Singh instead of, uh, um, then inherited Rauti and he for, continued to conquer the surrounding areas in, and he founded his own state. There's actually an interesting tale about how he founded Sailana. 
So it is said that he wanted to shift his capital to a safer location. He uh, therefore halted close to the Kedareshwar temple. And while sleeping, he got a dream in which the god Kedareshwar appeared before him and told him that the sewers of the new town that he was about to found was, would defile his temple. And he told Jai Singh that he should move east and build his capital at a place where he hunts his first game. So Jai Singh followed his advice and he uh, hunted his first game and he built a grand gate called Suraj Pole over there. So as you can see, the gate is on the left. So uh, this gate is still a uh, main gate for the palace compound. <clears throat> so now we'll move on to Raja Jaswan Singh. He was, uh, uh, he was one of the greatest rulers of Selana in terms of administration, you can say. He cleared debts that had continued for decades and he took several steps that um, increased the commerce in Selana a lot. His most notable work was during the famine of 1900. Uh, for his uh, uh, for his effective uh, way of dealing with the famine, he was given the gold Kesar Ehen medal uh, by the Prince of Wales. He had also built the Jaswan Nawaz Palace during this time to give employment to the people. This is my great grandfather, uh, Raja Dilip Singhji. Uh, he was a very progressive ruler, and he most of the buildings that you find in Selana and the surrounding. Uh, Villages that are still used by the government were actually built by him. One of his most notable achievements was the restoration of Kurukshetra. He formed the Kurukshetra Restoration Committee of which he was a permanent president. Uh, he also located the site on which the Gita was recited by Lord Krishna to Arjun and he built the Krishna temple there. Um, another notable thing is that uh, he founded the Selana cuisine. There's actually a tale behind that as well. It is said that while hunting, uh, he and his friends were separated by their entourage. And they knew how to hunt, but they did not know how to cook. So this made him realize the importance of cooking as a skill. And this hobby slowly turned into a legacy that was continued by his descendants. Um, many recipes were collected by other princely states, but there were also some interesting recipes of humble origin, like the Banjari Dal which he learned from a band of nomads. This is my grandfather, Raja Digvijay Singh Ji. He uh, continued the uh, Selana cuisine and uh, he invented many new recipes and he continued to collect several new recipes as well. Um, another thing that he did was, he, uh, was that he started the Cactus Garden, which is today very famous. And, uh, at that time, he had also started a rose garden, which was also very famous. Uh, he is also the author of the Cooking Delights of the Maharaj, as you can see the image on the left. And this is one of the oldest cookbooks of India, and it is also known as the Bible of Indian Cooking. On the lower right, you can see him cooking with his family and friends. He really enjoyed inviting people, and he used to like cooking with his family. And This is my father. Uh, he has conducted several food festivals around India and he further gained fame for Selana and uh, cuisine. On the right is my sister. She has helped uh, my father a lot uh, with the food festivals. And we have also organized food festivals at a palace in Rajasthan called Surajgarh. Now I will move on to the palaces. You can see the all, these are all old images of how they looked before. On the left is the Juna Mahal, which was built in the early 18th century. It is the oldest structure in the palace compound and was built by Raja Jai Singh Ji. Then the center image is uh, Rang Mahal, the earlier form, which was built in the mid 19th century and was the, an extension of the Juna Mahal was built as a janana or a woman section. On the right is the Jaswan Nawaz. This is a private residence and uh, it was built by Raja Jaswan Singh Ji in 1898. So today Jaswan Nawaz is a private residence and we are planning on turning Rang Mahal into a, a heritage homestay. This is an, these are
uh, some interesting images of the various palaces in the Malwa region. So you can see there's Ratlam, Multan, Sitama, and Ali Rajpur. And they are all, they all built in the similar time period and they're all very similar to the Selana Jaswan Nivas Palace. <clears throat> So now I'm going to be taking over and talking to you about the restoration. Um, before I start, I would just like to say that all the restoration work was carried out by my in-laws and my husband um, all these years. And so all the hard work, uh, effort and credit would go to them. And I'm just going to be talking you through everything that they did. So the set of pictures on the top is, the ex is, where, is from when the exterior renovation and paint work had begun a few years back. But a lot of work was done prior to this. So um, we are also very close to the Gujarat border. And so the 2001 Gujarat earthquake also affected our property. Um, there were many minor cracks in Rang Mahal and the entire foundation of Jaswan Nivas needed to be repaired. At the time, my in-laws consulted Mr. Bundu Rao, who is an uh, expert in limestone and heritage property restoration work. Um, and he's based in Bangalore. So he and his team dug 25 feet into the ground to repair the entire foundation of Jaswan Nivas. Uh, in 2017, my uh, in-laws moved back to Selana, which is when they began the restoration work in full swing. Um, so the first task carried out was to change the entire plumbing um, and water lines, after which the bathrooms were renovated and new bathrooms were made. Uh, there were many cracks and leakages in the ceilings, and so waterproofing was carried out across both palaces. Um, there were also three outer or old fort walls that needed that were heavily damaged and two of them needed to be rebuilt completely, um, while this one on the left uh, needed to be repaired. Um, so we continuously need to carry out de-weeding, especially during uh, the monsoons. And the picture on the right is our front courtyard and garages, which um, is before and post maintenance. Um, so here you will get a closer look at some of the finer details. So it was not only POP work, but also paint work that was, uh, I mean, it wasn't only paint work, but also POP work that was uh, done. Um, the picture in the center is the frontal facade of Jaswan Nivas. And both the lower and upper floor um, pillars are carved out of single piece Makrana marble. And now we'll take you inside Jaswan Nivas Palace. So this is the main dining hall and this picture was taken in 1982. And this is what it looks like today. So not much has changed. Um, the furniture is mainly British colonial or Anglo-Indian such as the scalloped side table. Our chandeliers are um, custom made Italian chandeliers that were sourced and brought in uh, during the 19th century. Um, and next is our billiards room and bar. So the billiards room is just next to the hall and the table is made by Dawson and Co who were a company based in Bombay. And um, the picture on the right is the bar, which to me looks like a set from Mad Men. Um, the interior style is very retro modern. Um, a lot of green is used throughout the room, which was a defining color of the era. So the bar table or unit itself is upholstered or made uh, from tiger skin. And a unique feature of this room uh, is the ceiling lights, which um, is filled and made out of champagne bottles. So it's a very tedious job to actually clean this uh, because we have to carefully remove each bottle. So this is um, a drawing room upstairs. And again, a lot of profusely carved furniture that is from the British colonial era. This room was recently renovated and wallpapered uh, post waterproofing. Um, and now we'll move to the cactus garden. So one of the main reasons tourism picked up in Madhya Pradesh and what the small town of Selana is famous for is the cactus garden. It was started in the 1960s by Raja Digvijay Singh. Um, and it began as a hobby and slowly turned into a very unique legacy. Um, so Raja Digvijay Singh enjoyed traveling a lot. And during his travels, he collected and bought many varieties of cacti back. And so we actually have only seven Indian varieties and the rest are from various parts of the world. Today, many of the plants that are almost 60 years old um, have grown to uh, heights of over 25 feet. And we've also put in a few pictures of ourselves to show you the height difference. So when looking at um, the projects to work on in the property, 
one of the first things that we wanted to start doing was to um, document and increase our cactus collection. Um, so we've practiced and successfully reported a number of cuttings um, and have also bought a few new plants that we can hopefully plant to the ground in a year or two. Um, we also found an old list of the cactus varieties. Um, and so we are going to start cross-checking which still exist and which don't um, so that we can reintroduce these species uh, into the garden. Um, so I just wanted to quickly uh, say that maintenance wise, uh, we have a few problems as well. Um, so one of the biggest problems is that um, the garden is open to visitors and so a lot of them uh, like to write or carve the names onto the plants or leaves. Um, and as you all know, uh, during the monsoons or heavy rains, um, uh, so during the monsoons or heavy rains, um, a lot of cactus succumb to root rot or other diseases. And so that's another problem. And lastly, we have a lot of uh, peacocks on the property. And while they're very attractive, they're also uh, very destructive. And so they like to walk or sit over some of the smaller plants. Um, so another project that we are working on is to convert Rangmahal into a home state. Um, and this is something I started working on, uh, working on early this year with my in-laws. Um, and, but COVID has, of course, slowed down our progress in work, which is why we have no pictures to show you as yet. Um, so our aim is to use our culinary culture to offer guests a unique experience um, and curate a range of food-related experiences. Um, so we're going to offer cooking classes or serve authentic and unique meals, including dishes that are not in the cookbook. Um, and we also want to offer guests local and rustic meals um, in this region. Apart from this, uh, the Malwa region is fairly untapped in terms of tourism, except for, of course, Mandu and um, Ujjain. So uh, there are a lot of old temples. Um, and of course, Mandu and Ujjain are very close to us. And we also have a bird sanctuary uh, that is home to the endangered lesser Florican. Um, so our property would be one of the first of its kind to open for guests to stay. So this is something exciting that we are looking forward to opening and starting. Um, so the next project that we are uh, working on is to launch a range of spices. So uh, just, uh, just, so just as how our ancestors practiced and perfected their recipes, they did the same with all the spices. Um, so nothing was store-bought. Everything, um, all the raw materials were sourced and um, their own measurements were made for each masala or spice. So our idea is to use these recipes, um, source organic and local raw materials and um, package it and launch it. So, uh, and we're also looking at the most sustainable and eco-friendly way that we can package it. And lastly, another project that we are working on, which is still under de development, is to open a museum. So when we started renovating um, the palaces, we had a collection of old weapons, artifacts, pictures, trophies, um, and home and uh, household appliances. And none of these, uh, they didn't come of use in either of the palaces. And so we decided to open a museum to showcase all this. Um, and we also hope to explore um, and show our families uh, unique history with food in this museum. Um, so all these ideas um, are still in their very initial and early stages. And so we're open to collaborations in any way. And with this, we come to the end of our presentation. Thank you very much for this um, wonderful presentation and tour de force and um, covering so much of the history and the current management and visions for the property, the problems you've also encountered. I'd like to have a conversation now between you and open also this up to the floor. This is the great um, opportunity for all of our guests to participate. And I must say, this is really wonderful to see that we really have guests who come every Friday, which is really lovely because we have created this really wonderful group of people who love historic houses in India, who care about their history, who are also often involved in, man in the management of historic property um, as well or have family um, relations. And um, this is really beautiful. So thank you very much for being such loyal friends of the center in this uh, particular series. Now, um, I have one question here from guests so 
far, namely, when do you think you're going to open up the property? What is your guess? Of course, we really can't, we don't have a crystal ball. We have the pandemic at the moment, so it's, we, we have to keep our guests safe and we can't really predict this. But from your point of view, as far as the restoration work is concerned, oh, so what would you have in mind? We are planning or at least hoping to open it by um, early next year, around January at least. Um, uh, it's also quite tough because uh, since we are in a tribal area and we are in a village, it's quite hard to get labor every day or carpenters or things like that. So um, we're hoping by January. Wonderful. I have another question here from guests. Now um, it's really beautiful what we can see and what you have done. The property looks fantastic, and I actually told you earlier I love the uh, the light green color for the woodwork and then the windows and so on. It looks really beautiful on the doors. Now someone asked, um, uh, did you get any help from the government for um, or, or from the ASI or something? Like there was a scheme by the government, but there was barely any help, so we did not really think about going for it. We just did everything on our own. Hmm. Fantastic. Um, yes, well, um, we as the Center for Historic Houses, we love to help in any way we can and we love to be in touch with um, owners of historic houses. We have a number of schemes and ways of collaboration. Um, I'm also happy to say that the lecture series has brought a lot of attention to the participating palaces. They have been featured in the press since and some scholars started doing research. So this is really nice to see. And we have been thinking also about um, assisting with the museum project, for instance, this is something we are very interested in, of course, as a university and a research university. Um, research is, of course, part of what we do. So we'd, um, you know, we'd love to, um, to be involved in this. And um, when I think about the history of food, which is so um, sophisticated and really inspiring in India. And we have so much evidence, even from Mohenjo-Daro and in, even in the Vedas, uh, food is mentioned, you know, especially milk, the important role of milk products. And really the food is so closely related to the history of India and how it changes from drinking habits, like drinking, um, don't put, not to put your lips on, on a cup. So this is something that I noticed, for instance, when I came to India, that people pour um, the water so in the mouth and then I found that this is also really related to, um, to um, historic um, times when people started doing this or for instance the importance of vegetarian meals that came with the Buddhist period in Ashoka and, um, and so on. So all of this is a fantastic part of, uh, of history and I really think it deserves to be showcased and, and shown. And also if you think about the material culture of food, I mean especially when I think about um, how the cookbook actually emerged. I heard the story in the, um, in the newspaper article that you mentioned um, of your sister-in-law, where she mentioned that the Maharaja had, <laughs> you know, this little um, spice box that he took along and he asked the chefs to um, use his spice box. And then the spices were all measured because of course no chef would ever reveal the amount or, you know, the mixture of the masalas. So he measured it and put it on the scale. So he knew exactly how much of the spices were used and of course I mean just looking at spice boxes and and you know the, the uh, design and there has also been I think a culture of metalwork um, in in your area uh, which would be wonderful to showcase and maybe produce even a collection of beautiful spice boxes this is something I find kind of hard to find in shops and most of them are very utilitarian and steel and I was hoping to see all of these traditional things when I came to India and many of them are not in readily available anymore on the market so this is something that would be really interesting to be shown and also the history of spices all of this so how do you how do you feel about this um, about launching the spices uh, about this kind of you know showcasing the material culture and combining the um, display of material culture with also patronage of uh, the production of um, you know objects and um, so on relating to this um, no, I mean, we, uh, it's a very interesting uh, topic. We're also looking for, I mean, we just spoke about this today. So, um, uh, yeah, we're just looking forward to working with you on this and um, to showcasing this as well. Wonderful. Then something else that I would like to know, and, and I'd like to accentuate this because many people don't know this, and I think, again, the lecture series has played an important part in showing um, the importance of royal families in 
in contributing to society. So it's not only that you actually uh, restore the property, but there's so much more because very often, you know, like in your case, we have a very rural area and people who work in the palace, they find their livelihoods also through the palace also. So how do you see this role? And now, you know, you as a young family, how would you like to kind of contribute to society and, and um, helping, um, you know, the community at large? Uh, I know, like, staff is uh, from the tribal community and um, they come here on a daily basis and we use them for all our work. So even um, recently uh, in Rang Mahal, for example, we were making a small courtyard and uh, instead of hiring someone to do the uh, tile work or the stone work, we asked our tribals to come in at the local uh, community and they did it for us. And I think they have um, creatively or artistically, they have a lot of skill. And so they've almost made it like sort of puzzle and they've really done it really well. So um, we're kind of using the local community and their skills to, um, to get our work done instead of hiring someone from outside, from Indore or from any other city. Um, and so I think even uh, in the future, we would probably uh, hope to continue doing the same. Wonderful. Could you tell us a little bit about the traditional crafts in the area? And I know you are a newcomer, basically, because you come from Mysore. Because when I had a look at the gazetteer, I found that there were certain kind of vegetable dyes that were particularly uh, produced in your era, um, area, but um, they were already replaced by industrial um, products and so on. So I would like to know, um, is this something that still exists or would you like to promote this? Because I know you're personally very interested also in organic um, food and, and so on. And the dye business actually died out during Raja uh, Dule Singh's time because the ones that were produced outside were much cheaper. So they stopped buying things from sellers. We actually like shifted to one. It was died out of that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, there are like uh, because the Selana region has uh, most of the tribes are from the Bheel uh, tribe. So they have their own very unique culture. They have their own paintings. They have a different way of building their huts and their clothes and even their archery and all. It's the way they make the bows and the arrows. It's all quite interesting. That way. Hmm. And then I also wanted to ask you about the food tradition and your role in this. Because from what I see from the cookbook, a lot of it was kind of collected. And of course, when we look at the history of food in India, um, there have been so many influences from different regions, from different religious practices, uh, foreign influences from Persia to even, you know, Anglo-Indian cuisine and, and so on. So this is a really, again, not only a recipe book, but it's a cultural history in a way as well. So um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about um, your education in this area and how you actually, what you want to do with it um, at the palace from, you know, the cooking and seminars and, you know, having a little restaurant. I don't know whether this would work because I don't know how remote it is and so on. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your vision there and what you hope to do. I've done my uh, education in culinary art, so I do want to do something in this line. So I do have plans on uh, coming up with another book and there are also plans on uh, making a cafe here in the palace which will, which will have a lot of Stellana recipes and I plan on cooking recipes which are not in the book as well for the people who will be staying here. So th that will be something different and uh, as for the local food that you were uh, Say, uh, saying uh, like there's not much but the, the food here is very rustic but at the same time it's really nice as well like there's something called dal panya which is uh, corn which is roasted in leaves and is made it's a tribal food but it's actually very tasty it's hmm. similar to uh, comparing it with scones <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> and how about you know now since you come from Mysore, will there be any influence from, you know, the food, the cuisine from Mysore also now in, in Solano? How about this? So, uh, at least that's not something I've thought of right now. Um, but maybe in the future, we could maybe do something. I don't hmm. have much knowledge about uh, food and cooking, so 
I don't think uh, I don't think I would probably do anything right now. Right, um, and so to explain something to me, um, like I've never been to Solana. Um, what makes the cuisine special? What are the unique features of the cuisine? One of the greatest things about Solana was that uh, in the tradition of Indian cooking, they never measured the masalas or anything. So my great grandfather was actually one of the first uh, person uh, in India to who used uh, jeweler scales to measure the masalas. So what happened was by doing this, we document our recipes really well compared to the other houses. So I think that's one of the most unique points that I would say. <laughs> Even now, if you will meet Indian cooks, they just like to uh, throw masalas and they don't like to measure it that well. So in our book, even the salt is measured. So that's how. <laughs> <laughs> and so, what what is a typical dish from the uh, Solana um, family? Um, many actually, like I'll have to think about it. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure our audience would like to try out a recipe. Salana dal. So the Salana dal is very tasty. Like it's got as much ghee in it as uh, like the dal and ghee are actually of the same proportion. You can imagine how rich it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And what spices do you use for the dal? Well, the interesting part, I just remembered a, a recipe which is called uh, mutton ka gulab jam. So it is made with uh, meat and it's a sweet oh. dish. Mutton ka gulab jam. So that was very interesting. And there was a vegetarian guest of my grandfather. We ate that and he was like, this is the best gulab jam I've ever had. And my grandfather just stayed silent. <laughs> He didn't know how to respond. So that's I, I was one. amazed when I came to India that a dal is not a dal. A dal is entirely different from family to family and region to region. It couldn't be more different. So um, I would like to know uh, would you use tomatoes in the dal and uh, what kind of spices would you use? And would you yeah, use no. coconut, for instance, like in South India, is there or, or not? And, coconut and at the same time we don't have tomatoes in any of our recipes because tomatoes came quite late to India. Oh. So all our recipes are like really old. So none of our recipes have tomatoes. In it. Interesting. And so um, I, I know you don't want to reveal too much <laughs> out of the kind of secret recipe, but um, what kind of spices do you use in the dal? Many. Like, uh, like the counter actually fills up. Like there are many which are very simple like uh, how I talked about the banjara dal. So that is actually a very simple recipe, but you have to cook it for, for, for like hours. So the, most of the Selana cooking is uh, slow cooking. You can't like rush into it. So it's mostly that. <laughs> and do you have a kind of um, like a tandoor or something like this? Is there some specific type of oven that is used in the region there? Uh, we normally call the kebab sulas here. Like it's a Rajasthani influence, I'm guessing. So it's cooked in a similar way in clay pots. Hmm. It's actually very important to want to uh, Right. And um, if I um, now ask your wife again, I know you have an interest in fashion. You studied um, fashion journalism as well. So how do you feel you want to bring this particular interest of yours and so on um, now to, to your new home? Um, so while I study journalism, it's more of a hobby uh, for me and I do write occasionally, um, but I'm more interested in the history of uh, fashion, especially Indian fashion and textiles. And um, so I have started doing some research about the different sort of textiles and local um, or tribal textiles that were not even textiles, even arts that was uh, in this region. Um, and it's quite hard uh, because we don't have much um, much information on it, um, but I have started doing something. I hope to uh, maybe in some way promote a local uh, craft. Wonderful. Do we have any photographs or are there any saris left from the family, for instance, so that we get an idea of what the fashion was um, in, in, the, in the family for the women? Um, so in uh, Salana, we actually, the, the traditional dress is a poshak, which is like a lenga sari. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we don't have pictures of it. And uh, what kind of materials did they prefer? Um, so I think in this region, it's mainly um, 
chiffons and um, uh, the some of the lehenga sarees were made uh, of silk satin as well Hmm. Wonderful. I think it's really fascinating. Again, um, the Center for Historic Houses, we are currently working on a historic houses collection where all the palaces are invited to showcase their particular collections and regional collections. We are starting the collection with the Palace Garden Project, which we will be launching soon, um, where we will be inviting families to um, contribute uh, with anything relating to gardens, because especially during the lockdown, we found that gardens have been um, a great source of you know so, um, great source of strength really for families and sometimes there were delivery problems so I also spend a lot of time working in the garden and um, so especially with your case I know that you're working also on the cacti and possibly um, having little cacti, cacti that can be for sale um, but this will take some time right because to to perfect it so by um, the garden collection we mean um, pots and planters for example and then of course we would love to have the idea of the palace garden in the home especially now when a lot of people are not able to travel which could range from also a range of masalas chutneys that are homemade um, and this would be really nice and I think especially for your case with the with the spices this would be really really wonderful and especially the masalas. Um, great. Is there something from the audience again? Let me just have a quick look um, so that I didn't uh, overlook any of the questions. Yes, tomatoes, potatoes and chilies all came from outside of India. This brings me, of course, to another topic that we've um, often kind of encountered, namely the fusion. Certain things that we they, they, they come from abroad, but they, they stop being foreign after some time, you know, especially with potatoes. You know, we, all, we have so many potato dishes now in, in the Indian cuisine or chai, for instance. You know, can you think of India without chai? Not really. But of course, it was introduced by the British or the same is true for Germany. The potato is um, not from Germany originally, but, you know, potato salad is a very German dish. And, um, you know, similarly. Yes. So uh, great. So uh, yes, there will be a second um, cookbook. You are already working on this. So we know about this, wonderful. And um, yes, of course, collecting the material culture. I wanted to ask you, do you have a spice box? Actually this, um, what is it called? Dani or, or um, masali da masala dani or what is it called um, in Hindi? Do you have something like this from your um, ancestors? We didn't have an old or spice box. No, 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 It doesn't exist anymore from the family? No? Because especially after the story, when I heard the Maharaja use this Dani, it took it along, to, you know, on all the, you know, visiting the 500 palaces. So I'm wondering, because this would be, of course, a lovely thing to have and to tell the story. No, it doesn't exist. And do you use it? What kind of material do you use for your spice box? Or do you have individual containers? Yes, I normally like to keep in them in airtight boxes. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing special as such. Right. I have, um, I have um, a depiction of some 19th century spice boxes um, that I can sh share with you. Hold on. Um, let me just go to screen share quickly. Is this visible? Yes, it's visible. So this is really wonderful. I have this one here from, which is made out of terracotta from the 19th century, which is now at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Then the beautiful silver one from Lucknow, also from the 19th century. And uh, here, this one is actually from your region, from Malva a parcel gilt a silver spice box, which looks uh, kind of Mughal from the 19th century, which I found at, at uh, Bonhams, and it has these kind of uh, battle leaf uh, shapes, uh, heart shapes, um, that, that is really interesting, possibly also for the use of uh, battle leaves. So there are some beautiful boxes, and of course, some of them were made um, also out of wood, uh, but I think this would be a wonderful thing um, for you to collect also, given your, um, given your interest. Uh, Right, so let me just go back to some of the questions and um, yes, 
Yes, exactly. The idea of a masala box is for sale is terrific. Yes, absolutely. I thought so. It's really a must. And I, especially because, you know, as I said, from own experience, I, I couldn't find any of them. So I really think this would be a lovely idea. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And yes, one more question here uh, to both of you. Please, could you mention your favorite um, dishes from the cookbook? <sighs> Well, when we rush out to, to order it, we would like to try out your favorite dishes first. <laughs> I actually haven't tried all the dishes as yet, um, but from what I've tried, I think um, I like the, there's a dish called the Shafakshi. Shafakshi, and it's um, mutton and it's cooked mainly in milk. Uh, and that? that's my. Which one? I don't... It's called uh, the Shafakshi. Oh, please, if you could write this down in the chat box then also for us to share, because I think this would be really fascinating so, so that we can try this out. And, um, you know, I remember reading from the preface that, um, you know, everyone wants to cut corners today and so on, but this book is a little bit more complicated. So you need to come with a little bit more time. So this is why I said I want to try it out on the weekend. Or do you think there are some recipes that are not so difficult? Or this is the other thing, you are a professional, but for others, um, <laughs> maybe some are easier to try out. Uh, easiest would be, I recently made this one called Bay Masale or Korma. So there are no masalas in this recipe. There's only curd, uh, mutton, and then there's, uh, you know, so there was, Kevra jal, which is, I don't know the English word for it. It's made with three recipes and it's very tasty. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, I also wanted to ask you, Shubashish, thank you very much. Um, do you use some tribal paintings to decorate the palace and especially as far as the guest rooms are, are, are concerned? I'm also an interior designer, so I'm really interested in, in how you want to do the guest rooms and so on, because now you've been particularly uh, worried about the uh, exterior part and so on. But what is your kind of aesthetic vision and so on for the guest rooms? What do you hope to achieve as far as the atmosphere is concerned? Um, we uh, so we have a lot of old furniture with us um, that was probably used in those rooms earlier. And so we're kind of um, polishing and uh, repairing those and we're going to use that in guest rooms as well. Um, and in terms of tribal art, uh, we don't have any in the palace, but um, I think it would be interesting uh, and it would be a good idea as well to uh, sort of look into that and um, maybe use that for the homestay. Wonderful. Oh, someone tried already. Oh, oh uh, Dr. Kiran Gupta, lovely. Yeah, I cooked the magoba, the mutton dish today. It turned out really well. <laughs> Excellent. This is so nice because actually I shared the cookbook on our Facebook group. And I must say the Center for Historic Houses Facebook group is very active and uh, we share lots of ideas there. And um, I shared the book and a number of people have now bought it and tried it out. That's really lovely. Yes. Um, yes, and this is an important question because I heard about the uh, liquor as well <laughs> in Solana. So are you going to revive some of these famous Solana uh, uh, liquors as well? Me in the future, but currently we are not really thinking about going to the liquor business. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have a lot on your plate already from the restoration to the cactus garden um, to the um, spices that you want to do and, and homestay and everything. Yes. Um, Wonderful. So let me see. Have I, I don't want to miss any of the questions. Yes, uh, Shata Visha, thank you. Any exciting crockeries or cooking methods that you would like to share? Bunai is given a lot of importance in our cuisine. So Bunai is basically that you uh, let the mutton cook when there's no water. And as soon as you feel that the masala has started to stick, you put a bit of water and properly mix it again. Hmm. So you keep continuing. So different recipes have different numbers of bunai. So this is actually a very important step if you want that smoky flavor in your food. I, um, I'm also wondering what kind of pots do you use and what kind of material do you use? Because a lot has been kind of written and said about the material, which, you know, about the heat and brass or not brass and not steel and so on. So what would you suggest? book actually suggests a lot. Like my grandfather's written, in the beginning, you can see a lot of my, my grandfather's notes about what 
vessels you should use for what dishes, what you shouldn't do, uh, even a bit of the history of uh, uh, how our cuisine is, uh, has been influenced by the surrounding regions like Iran and Afghanistan. So there's a lot of uh, these things about, over there. But there were many special vessels that were used by my great grandfather and grandfather. And, and are you and still of in this? the room? And, and we where would plan you on keeping them in the. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. So, are you following his recommendations? And where would you buy these uh, kind of pots? Because again, if I go out and step to the market, I don't see. I only see steel. I don't see any kind of other pots anymore. So, what would you recommend? It's not a necessity, but I think my grandfather and his father were so particular about each and everything that they used to do these things. But you can cook it in the modern uh, dishes and all as well. Mm. But of course, you know, we really are concerned about health and so on and what is better. So I've uh, looked at, um, you know, iron and, and, and so on. So, and, you know, I'd really like to know like copper or brass or, or, or iron. What do you personally prefer? Uh, I, I particularly don't mind uh, anything, but yes, copper is a better vessel to cook in. Like, uh, you know, Ayurveda and everything, they do say that it's a better uh, mm. metal. Oh, yes, here we have another really interesting question because I remember from Belga um, Belgardia Palace, there was some beautiful tribal jewelry, and this is more like a question now for your wife. Um, what about the jewelry and so on of the family and uh, what also about the local uh, jewelry? So both the family tradition of jewelry, because in usually all of the palaces that we uh, discussed, there was a lot of focus on, on the jewelry and so on. We haven't heard so much about, about the women in this case, uh, so I'd love to know a little bit more. Um, so I think the jewelry of Selana is also very similar to um, uh, traditional Rajput yeah. jewelry that goes from Rajasthan as well. Um, so I think one traditional uh, piece is the Timanya, um, and that's a sort of toker, um, and that's what I wore on my wedding. So I think that's the most uh, as a traditional piece. Oh, wonderful. So you wore this from the family for your own wedding? Or just this kind of style of jewelry? No, from the family. From the family, how lovely. Oh, I wish uh, we could see a photograph now. I'll ask you again for this, that'd be really nice. Um, thank you, good. Um, yes, so I think I've covered all of the questions and um, I look, I, I'm very much looking forward to seeing the finished um, project and we are looking at um, early next year. And again, if I look at our um, older properties, it would be really nice to kind of visit Mandu, for instance, and also visit Ahilya Fort. It would be a really lovely route, maybe organize a cooking seminar. So would it be possible to cook, you know, like to, to book a private party with the cooking um, um, seminar or something like this? Because these are really fun events um, for friends and so on. Would, would it be possible to do something like this and book it at the palace? I think or how do you intend to do these? Um, we have planned uh, to do this. And so, um, yes, you can book, a group of people can come and stay with us and um, learn to cook if they want, or uh, we can even offer them uh, uh, meals um, with uh, Selana food. Wonderful. So would this be in the palace kitchen or would you have a show kitchen for this or where would this take place? Um, so we are planning to uh, open a, a kitchen and a sort of open air kitchen and a more rustic um, kitchen as, uh, as well with a rustic plan. And Wonderful. so, more interactive and engaging experience. Fantastic. So thank you so much. Um, and I think we all are really curious to come and visit, especially after having seen these beautiful photographs and the fascinating cactus garden. And we would love to try the cuisine. Um, thank you very much. And uh, we look forward uh, to hearing from you. And um, yes, Shubhashish, is there any current and picture of surroundings outside the palace. Yes, I think it's the, uh, particularly from the uh, cactus garden, these were recent photographs, right, that you showed. Yeah. And so basically this is surrounded by landscape. By, uh, so uh, in front of the property is the main marketplace of the town. And behind us, that's behind the cactus garden, uh, there's a lot of farmland. Beautiful, right. Thank you very much um, again for your presentation and we'll stay in touch and um, I'm very, very excited about your plans for the museum as well. Thank you.
bye bye and anyone else if you have questions for the Center for Historic Houses, if you're interested in the Palace Garden collection, if you are a palace and you'd like to present a lecture or participate in any of our initiatives, such as the Historic Houses um, collection, please um, get in touch with me. I'll also um, just mention my email address. And I'll just stay on a few more um, minutes. Um, for those who would like to um, ask any more questions. Otherwise, I say thank you very much for participating and for coming. Bye-bye and see you, see you soon. Bye.